Thank you, James, very much for that fine lesson. That's one that will always be needful to everybody, and certainly with some far more than others, but it's always important. Word of encouragement, and we don't know when that word will be so much needed. And I think tonight, uh, your lesson is a good one for a lot of folks and a good message to take to heart as we walk daily serving the Lord. Appreciate it very much. We want to continue in our study now of First Peter. And we're in First Peter chapter 2. And we were discussing about verse 9 when we left off last week. And we'll go back there at this particular time. Peter is emphasizing in this verse, as we noted in our last class, just who Christians are. And he points out you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Remember what we said about peculiar people. Uh, American Standard 1901, a people for God's own possession. It has to do with the fact we've been purchased. We've been brought, bought by the blood of Christ. That's the emphasis. And what is the whole point of this? What's the reason for belonging to God? Uh, being this chosen generation, this special people, this royal priesthood. Well, notice the latter part of the verse that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Well, one of the things that ties in with this is the verse that I quote most often, and you're very familiar with it, and it's Colossians 3.17. How do I show forth the praises except by submission to the Lord's will from the heart? There's no other way to do it. I don't even know how to praise God if I don't comply with the teachings of Christ in the New Testament. The way that I show my love for God, my faith in God and the system of salvation, this of course is true of all Christians, is to be obedient to his will. And thereby we change our likeness into the likeness of Christ. So we change our state of being unconverted to being converted. We live the Christian life. And what James had to say in his talk this evening certainly shows us one of those areas which every Christian can do that. There may be some things harder for some people to do, but everybody can have a word of encouragement and a kind word, an encouraging word, and even words sometimes that rebuke. Uh, our Lord loves people with a love we can never fathom and that we're to emulate. Sometimes he would rebuke people. And knowing how to do that and when to do it, over what we should do it, all that has to do with keeping a, helping a person keep walking in a well-pleasing manner to God. I suggest, as I've taught classes on this, it's been a good while now, on the Bible and mental health. Well, of course, the true mental health comes from the one who is converted to Christ, who is a genuine New Testament Christian. That's the way that we begin to do that, as Paul said to Timothy, that he's not given us the spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. Well, soundness of mind comes through soundness of doctrine. It helps us see the world as it is, see ourselves as we really are, and do a lot of things James suggested this evening, especially the latter part of his sermon, I would talk about the self-doubt that many people have. And yet, if you understand that the Lord's on your side, everything heaven's doing is for this uh, royal priesthood, for this holy nation, for this purchased people to help us live and become like Christ. So he's called us out of darkness by the gospel of Christ. And we're in his marvelous light. Remember how John in his writings constantly referred to light in the light of the truth of God. And that's where we are. We're to live according to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And notice the sentence doesn't end with verse 9. He says, which, referring to Christ, 
which in time past are referring to the people of Christ, which in time past were not a people. In other words, who are we outside of Christ? Really, what good are we to anybody ultimately outside of Christ, lost in our sins, cut off from God? The best we can be to ourselves, to our families, to one another, is when we are converted to Jesus Christ. When we obey the gospel and believing in Christ, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in the Christ as the Son of God, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of our past sin, and knowing when we rise from the watery grave of baptism, we are in Christ. We're in the place where God's grace abounds. We are a child of God. We're reconciled to God. We're justified in His sight. We are simply headed toward heaven. Now we can be worth something to people like we never could be before because we're going to let Christ be seen living in us and thereby show forth the praises of God. So we're God's people. We belong to him. He regulates our life. He shows us how to live. He gives us direction. Notice outside of Christ, we have not obtained mercy. Well, that mercy is available to everybody. But outside of Christ, we're outside of the benefits of the mercy of God. But now notice he says, you have obtained mercy. Well, we obtain that mercy by belief and obedience to the gospel. Remember, Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 6, 17 and 18, saying that God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Actually, the doulos of sin, the slaves of sin. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that pattern of teaching, which was delivered you being then, when you obeyed that form of doctrine, made free from sin. You became the servants or the slaves of righteousness. Now remember, all of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 172. So we have launched our lives on a course when we became Christians of being slaves to righteousness by our own choice because we know that God would not require of us anything but that which would be good for us. So we are determined to live on his level of living according to his way of living in the flesh. So notice how he shows his deep concern and care for them in verse number 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech. That word beseech, again, as I say many times, means he's imploring them. As it were, he's on bended knee, begging them as strangers and pilgrims. You're just passing through this world. You cannot put down roots that will keep you here forever. It won't work. There's nothing we can perceive and experience through our five senses that's going to last. You can't get out of this world and take your body with you. You're going to have to leave it. James says the body apart from the spirit is dead. We're taught plainly that the body returns to the dust from which God made it. The spirit returns to God. Thus, the Christian who's been purchased from his sins and made whole through the blood of Christ and his obedience to the gospel is now living on the spiritual level. He's sowing to the spirit by keeping the commandments of Christ. Thus, he's not caught up in the affairs of this present world. And again, these people were being persecuted because they loved and obeyed Christ. So they needed to know that even the persecution is temporary. It won't last. Anybody that's sick, that won't last. But on the other hand, if you're healthy, that's not going to last either. Nothing of this world lasts. If you say, well, it may last 20 years or 30 years, well, what is that to eternity? Eternity is unending. And we have here in this fleshly body an opportunity to, 
to choose life everlasting through belief and obedience to the truth and living our lives in harmony with it. Now, Peter knows this when he writes this letter. Remember, most of the letters of the New Testament are written to churches and to individual Christians. And the whole reason they're being written is to keep people faithful. So we see, he says plainly, that you're to abstain, leave them alone, cut yourself from them, don't participate in them, don't let them influence you. What? Fleshly love. Because look what they do. They blind you to the everlasting thing, spiritual thing. They war against the soul. Jesus would say when he was on the earth, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so it is we must be reminded by things like Peter's writing, by the message that James delivered tonight, what our duties are. We're that way. We're human. We're finite. We're weak. And as Christians, we must be reminded about our duty to God as children of God, who we are. Do we think that these people didn't know? I mean, after all, they're Christian. That they didn't know that they were a purchased people, that they were a royal priesthood, that they were a holy nation. Why does Peter have to say this to them now? It's not like they never knew it. Why, it's simply to remind them, to encourage them, to make sure they are living in the light of the fact of who they are. Not like they were when they were, they're not like they were when they were outside of Christ. No, that's all changed. They can't let the affairs of this present world, even under severe persecution, draw them back into living for the here and now because that's going to pass. So we look and see what he says in verse 12. Having your conversation, that's your manner of life, your conduct, whether at home, at work, at school, in the neighborhood, having your conduct honest. Now you think about that just for a moment. Uh, how many people really are honest in this world? A lot of people talk about honesty. But then how many really practice it? And yet Luke 8 verse 11 says, that the seed of the kingdom of the word of God is going to bring forth fruit in the honest and good heart. So we want to care for the truth. Honest people care about the truth. And the truth is reality. Honest people care about the reality. It's like this. God, as it were, is the prosecuting attorney, has indicted us as sinners. Now, to be able to benefit from the mercy of a perfectly just God and all-knowing God, we don't try to resist the fact, say, well, I'm not a sinner. I, my life hasn't been that bad, et cetera, et cetera. No, we acknowledge it. Anybody that's genuinely from the heart obeyed the gospel had to come to grips with the fact I am a sinner. It's my fault. I can't lay blame on anybody else for the sins I've committed. And I acknowledge to God that I am separated from him by my sins and that if pure justice were exercised upon me right now, I would be assigned to a devil's hell forever. But I'm crying for mercy. And so we acknowledge what God says and we turn to him for mercy. And how do we do it? We obey the gospel of Christ and all that that means. And that's what these people have done. And to live righteous before God so that the blood of Christ could continually cleanse them from their sin. Remember what John said in verse John 1, 7? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I've all pointed out in the Greek, that's present tense. Greek present tense means linear action. It keeps on cleansing. Keeps on cleansing who? The one that walks in the lives of his life. Well, what does that mean? It means you're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain, that is pointless or worthless, where? 
in the Lord. First Corinthians 15, 58. For the Lord's located all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. So in Christ, we are totally dependent upon God through Christ and the gospel message. So how are we to live? Where we're to live as God directs us. That gets back to what I said a moment ago in Colossians 3, 17. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus by his authority, giving thanks to God the Father by him. So notice when you do this, and this gets right down to some of the people that were even persecuting the Christians at that time. He says, when you do this, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. What does that mean? Your example the power of your example, I don't guess any of us ever realize how important that is, which means if it's a bad example, it also exerts a great deal of influence over people. It's good influence, bad influence. A good example is putting into practice the things the Bible teaches Christians are to do, how we're to live. A bad example is going to exert influence that leads people away and not to Christ. So it's the pattern of living that we're to live as the New Testament sets it, that out. So having your conversation, your manner of life, honest among the Gentiles. Now remember, he's already uh, told them and reminded them that you are spiritual Israel. So the Gentiles will be any non-Christians. He's using terminology that would have been set up under the Old Testament between the Jew, the children of Israel, those approaching God under the law, separated people, and all those who are not Jews. Well, he applies that then to the church, spiritual Israel. Anybody not a member of the church, not a Christian, would be then of the Gentiles. Those who live according to this present world, lost in sin, they haven't responded to the truth. In fact, many of these would be warring against the church. Then notice what he says, and I think this is very significant. After he says your example will have a great deal of impact on those evildoers, uh, those genuine evildoers, they call you evildoers, but the one who are really evildoers are those who oppose you, those who seek to hurt you because you live like the Lord said. But then now notice verse 13. I think this is interesting that he immediately moves to this and how our nation needs this and we as Christians need to be reminded of. After he says what he says in verse 12, he says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Now, that's really interesting, especially when you think about the Roman Empire and the Caesars who ruled over it and the various governors and procurators and all those people involved in the machinery of that empire and the general immoral, amoral society and culture that permeated the whole of the Mediterranean world. What he's telling us here is that even when you have a bad government, it's still government, or God ordained civil government. Notice that God never did ordain the kind of government that ought to be. Now, he sets up certain guidelines. Paul deals with that, and it'd be a good time for us to look at that for a moment. In the Roman epistle, in uh, chapter 13. Let's look over there at uh, Romans, just for a moment, chapter 13. I always found this to be interesting, and in that here's a letter written to the church at Rome. That's Imperial Rome. That's right where the Senate of Rome met, and the emperor was located. Then notice what Paul says about this, and the Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to write Romans 13 is the same Holy Spirit that had the Apostle Peter write what he did when he said, submit yourself to every ordinance 
of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king and supreme. We're going with it a little later. Notice Paul says, let every soul be subject under the higher powers. They're both saying the same thing. For there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Ordained is appointed. How would we live in this world if there was no civil government? I've been in various countries. The world had various kinds of governments. And I think when I go into those governments, I think of how different they are from the government of the United States. And yet I don't know of a civil government that does not have corrupt people in it where everything's done just exactly like God wants it done in every aspect, on every level for you. Yet here the, apostle, the apostles are telling us to have great respect for that civil government. Notice in verse 2, Whosoever, that's as broad as the human race. Therefore, therefore, in the light of what I just taught you in verse 1, Paul writing Romans 13, 1. Therefore, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. Now, can language get any clearer than that? And will it not mean on the day of judgment just what it means now? It certainly means now what it's going to mean then. And if we can say that about Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, verse 38, and so on, we can say it about this. Especially when you think about the emperor and imperial Rome. And you know, this therefore has nothing directly to do with what kind of life the emperor was living or what kind of lives the Roman Senate was living. It had to do with law and order. And it's rather interesting to know that English common law derives from Roman law, and our law of the United States derived from English common law. Now, we look at this, we see further in verse 3 of Paul's writing, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Now think about that for a moment. When was this written? Well, it was written almost 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire to the church that met in the imperial city of Rome. I've often wondered, would it be possible that some of the people that made up the Roman government could read this letter? Paul will mention that he had converted some in Caesar's household, the Praetorian Guard. That's the special bodyguard of Caesar. So we know the gospel got that far. If it got that far, I'm sure you got further. So this is not saying now they're corrupt and mean and awful, overthrow the government. He doesn't say that at all. In fact, it's very opposite. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. Now, you're thinking, yeah, but what about those laws that go against God? How many laws of this country govern us right now that cause you to sin against God if you keep it? I think we ought to think about that. Because Peter made it clear when they were charged not to preach any more in the name of the Lord that they had to go ahead and do that because to not do that would be to fail to obey God. When you go back to the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Daniel, and of course the three Hebrew children were told, like everybody else in the land, were commanded that was the civil law. To worship the idol or be burned, they simply responded and said, we can't do it. Violation of the law of our God. We're not going to do it. He can save us if he wants to, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to do it. But we have to make a difference between laws we don't like 
that are strict on us more than we think they ought to be? Are they distasteful? Are they binding? Over and against laws that actually cause us to sin against God if we keep them. There's a difference. I found that some people tend to think they uh, sin against God if something's being done to inconvenience them. Well, I admit there may be laws that inconvenience a lot of folks. But unless they're causing us to violate God's will in keeping those laws, we sin against God if we don't. Now, if that's not what Paul is saying, what Peter's saying, what would he write, have to write to say it? It's obvious then, under usual matters, that God intended civil law to protect people. Listen to what Paul said further in verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. So if thou then not be afraid of the power, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience. Sake. Now, does that mean that the civil government must be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and all that means to the citizens of the United States? No, it doesn't. They didn't. They they didn't have such a thing as that at the time Paul wrote this. And yet Paul is saying this is the way you Christians are to be. You don't simply overthrow the laws you don't like. And if he's not saying that, I want to know what he would have to write. To say that. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of God of man for the Lord's sake whether it be to the king and supreme or to governors as to them that are sent by him for the punishment of the evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Let me ask you something. Are you a Christian? Yes. Well, then do you do well as the New Testament defines doing well? Then you have an obligation to obey civil government. And this is one of the things that uh, characterize Christians when they put this to practice in the Roman Empire. You say, yes, but they, they suffered at times. Well, of course they suffered. But they were taught how that they were to deal with that. Now let's take for just a moment. Let's look at Paul himself. Paul was a privileged person in the empire, not just by being a Christian. I don't mean that. Paul was a Roman citizen. There are all sorts of people in the empire that didn't have that privilege. And it was a great privilege. It meant just exactly what we see happen to him when he was in Jerusalem. They had arrested him and did not know he was a Roman citizen. They should have been particular, especially the Roman captain. And when he realized he could not get justice from the Jews, but remember the 40 men that decided not to eat a drink, they'd kill it. His nephew found out about that. And he came and told Paul, and Paul said, you go tell the chief captain. He did. That's when Paul made it known that he was a Roman citizen. Now, if you go back and read those verses, you'll find out that sort of put that chief captain on the spot. Greatly so. Now, what rights did a Roman citizen have? Have you ever noticed that small army that that captain put together to protect Paul while he took him out of the city and took him all the way to Caesarea? That's kind of privilege that Paul had. And he used it to get himself out of a kangaroo court that was bent upon doing one thing, destroying it. So it shows us we have a right, an obligation, really, as Christians to use civil laws however we can. In this case, he freed himself by using it. We have privileges, we have rights in America he never knew of. Because the greatest of rights and privileges of a Roman citizen wouldn't compare to what we have in protection of the Constitution. 
when you look at our constitution and when you see the way things are done in America, and that's where we are, so we might as well talk about where we live in being a Christian right here. We'll see then that we ought to be using these freedoms to spread the gospel, defend the faith, and if someone decides to challenge us, follow the example of Paul. We have a right to call on the courts and everything else. Now, if somebody says, you folks can't be Christians anymore. It's against the law to be baptized, against the law to be a member of the Church of Christ, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's another story. It's against the law to own a Bible. That's another story. God did not grant the civil government the right to do that, but it also means that we've got to discern the difference and even how to act. You know, Paul one time asked that the lawyers be consulted on his behalf. Well, how was that so? He baptized the Holy Spirit to work miracles. Why would he need lawyers? Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be an apostle didn't guarantee knowledge in all things. So we need to be mindful of the fact that civil law is from God. The devil didn't give a civil law. That also, civil law can take various forms. That also, everybody that is a part of civil government, in our case, federal, state, or local, is not required to be a New Testament Christian with the faith of Peter and Paul. We have to live under those type of things. And the Lord's made it very much more easy, very reasonable for us to realize how we're to do so. But the first thing is, is to understand, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. The only exception is to submit yourself to Lord to, to the civil government laws, causes you to violate God's law, not to be able to perform God's law, then you have a right not to obey. I thought those things were interesting in view of the fact that he just got through talking about in the last three or four verses of who you are as a Christian and that you are a person to set a godly example. And what better example than to show that you are a law-abiding citizen. You respect the laws of the land. You don't get out here in great demonstrations and try to burn down this or do that. You're a peaceful person. Think about how the Lord carried on his ministry. How he did the time he was on earth. He had no sit-ins in some place or he didn't have any kind of demonstrations. Everything was peaceful. And yet, he lived righteous, perfect, tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. And yet he said what needed to be said. And he didn't hesitate to talk about the chief rulers and all that and all their hypocrisy. Nothing wrong with us doing that and talking about immorality, the lack of spirituality, and using the truths of God to show when things are going wrong, such as abortion, such as homosexuality, such as this transgender business. That's all very important that we speak up on that. And we have an example of that besides our Lord, and that is John the Baptist himself. Remember what he said about Herod and Herodias' erroneous marriage? It is not lawful for thee to have her. Now, it got his head cut off and put on a platter. But better our heads be put off, cut off and put on a platter because we said the truth in all cases than to be left on our shoulders and the truth not be said. Truth is always the under guy, underlying thing in these matters. That's the truth we're studying here. It's the truth that Peter is teaching. But we want to be law-abiding citizens wherein we can. Be very sure before we disobey a law saying, well, that caused me to sin, that it actually causes me to commit a sin of commission or omission. I hope these things will be helpful and we'll continue with them more in our next time together. If you would now, before we close the class, would you bow with me for the prayer? Our Father in heaven, we bow before thee humbly, thanking thee for thy word. For without it, how would we know how to walk, how to live? 
what to teach. Help us to put it into practice in our lives and all day long, every day. Help us to teach the truth to others, to fight the fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Give us good wisdom and judgment to feed us in evil and raise us up in good. For we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.